All right. Well, welcome everybody to our uh, Reliable Asset World Preview webinar. Um, today we've got Andy Page from Allied Reliability Group here with us, um, who's going to kind of take us through the presentations that uh, you can expect to uh, hear at at the conference and uh, give us a little bit more background on on some of the some some of what you can expect um, so hopefully you'll learn you'll learn some today but also uh, find out all the great things that you you can learn by actually coming down to our event um, so that's the purpose of today's webinar um, just some background real quick before I turn it over to Andy so um, our reliable asset world conference is co-located with our ultrasound world conference which is in its 11th year and two years ago we realized that the ultrasound world conference which started out obviously very ultrasound specific. We'd have customers come and present on, um, you know, do case studies for us, share their best practices, what they're doing at, at their facilities. Um, and over the years, we realized we were feeding in more and more reliability centered presentations, um, which was great and people loved it. But it meant there was less room for uh, the ultrasound part of it, which is obviously something folks still wanted uh, to hear about and see us focus on. So we decided last year to launch Reliable Asset World and uh, have have one set of sessions taking place um, that would be all related to um, reliability, asset management, anything and everything to do um, with uh, that part of the puzzle. And then, of course, now get Ultrasound World back to, to its roots and where it started. So um, we're pretty excited that we've got these two offerings. Um, so anybody that comes, you can take advantage of, of uh, sitting in presentations with uh, on either side of the, the fence there and, and really uh, learn, learn a lot. So um, today, though, we are going to focus more on what's going to happen at Reliable Asset World. And like I said, we've got Andy Page, who's uh, with Allied Reliability Group, and they are our platinum sponsor uh, for the conferences, so we want to thank them for that. Um, they'll be down there. They've got uh, a couple speakers that are going to be presenting, and they'll have an exhibit booth and everything, so we're we're uh, thankful for that. And uh, Doug Wagen from our uh, from UE Systems is also online today, and he's going to help out uh, with Andy a little bit too, um, kind of batting back and forth some some questions and some topics. So uh, that's what we got in line uh, in store for you all today. And with that, I am going to toss the screen over to Andy and let him take it away. Great, thank you very much. So let me just click this button and make sure it's working the way it's supposed to. Do. Right. Can you can you see the slide in presentation mode, Maureen? I do. It looks great. Okay, wonderful. So I'm not going to read each of the abstracts for you guys. You can go to UE Systems website and you can uh, see all the abstracts and read them yourself. But I will, you know, kind of read the titles and we'll talk generally about what this session is about and more importantly why it's important. Maybe even give you a little background on the topic itself. Right. So this first keynote. Uh, Ten things you can begin doing to become an exceptional reliability leader. Uh, presented by Doug Plugnet, who works for uh, Allied Reliability Group. So, known Doug for a long time. Um, Doug is certainly qualified to speak about things that uh, you can do to become an exceptional reliability leader. He's worked with a bunch of them uh, in his career. So, this is a, this should be a really engaging presentation. Now. One of the things Doug is talking about here in the presentation is this idea of creating that culture that embraces the value of maintenance and reliability. And uh, Maureen, we seem to be getting some background noise. I don't know if you can help with that or not. Yeah, I was hearing that. Uh, Doug, you might need to mute yourself till you're ready to chime in. I was hearing that too. Okay, thanks. So. Uh, Doug's talking about creating a culture that embraces the value of maintenance and reliability. And, you know, we throw that term culture around quite a bit. So I thought I would, just to embellish the message that Doug is talking about, I thought I would briefly discuss culture and a little bit on leadership to kind of kind of get you frame, get Doug's presentation framed up, you know, uh, in your mind anyway. So when we think about culture, we have to realize that it is the shared, shared, emphasis on shared beliefs, values, and behaviors of a group. 
So anytime we start talking about shifting a culture or changing a culture, we have to realize that it is the shared beliefs and values uh, and behaviors of a group. So, you know, changing the entire group's beliefs, changing their values, changing their behaviors is not an easy thing to do. And it, re and like Doug talked about in his abstract, it re it's going to require a group of strong leaders. And you know, leadership is something that we we hear about a lot, and we and people love to say, "Yeah, I'm a leader," and I hope the organization recognizes that. And you know, I want to rec you know the recognition of being a leader, and I want to be in a leadership position. Uh, of course, that's easy to say, but the challenge is, you know, um, you know, on the technical side, things are relatively easy compared to the people side. You know, when we talk about calculating the required you know, wire size or calculating the required, you know, load on a beam or something like that. That stuff is pretty easy. Uh, with Excel, you could teach a high school kid to do that in an afternoon. All right, that's, that's no brainer. Um, the hard stuff is getting adults to behave differently. And of course, this is leadership. Leadership is getting people to do something different than what they're currently doing. All right, so, so I think Doug's presentation is very timely because more and more we see organizations wanting to embark on this reliability journey, but they might not have enough reliability leaders in their group to do so. All right? So the challenge for individuals would be you know, to not look for that easy way out. Right? We hear a lot of people, the way they talk about it, they, they want to be appointed a leader so, and once they get appointed, then they'll start leading. Well, it doesn't work that way. No organization ever makes someone a leader who hasn't already exhibited leadership characteristics, leadership traits, leadership behaviors, right? It has to be earned. So, you know, I, I think it's great that Doug's doing this presentation. I think it's great that Doug's going to give you 10 things that, that from his experience, he, he knows you can start doing to begin exhibiting those leadership attributes, leadership qualities, leadership traits, and then you know the idea is once you start exhibiting those, organization will notice that organization will put you in more of a formal leadership role because you have already begun to exhibit those leadership traits. So hats off to Doug for choosing that topic, and uh, I think you guys will find it really, really advantageous. Um, so Maureen, I guess if you've got questions coming in from the crowd or whatever, maybe we have to just pause at the end of each slide before we move on to the next one. Yeah, and you know, I, I forgot to mention, um, normally I kind of do a little housekeeping, so just let me jump in now and, and let folks know. Um, so we are recording this, um, so for those of you that may have to hop off early or got colleagues that, that you think would have benefited from listening in. We'll have this up on our website, so you can take a look, uh, take a listen then. And also, yes, we definitely welcome questions. Um, so you can type those right into your little panel on the side. Um, so send those in to us, um, and we'll get those asked. Um, Doug, I don't know if you've got any questions. I, I don't have any coming through on my end. Yeah, Andy. You know, I know Doug's going to talk about in this presentation. The things that you can do, but what do you see as some mistakes that people typically make um, when they start on these reliability journeys? Uh, I mean, even as an individual, what are some things they should avoid? What are some typical mistakes they make when trying to become a reliability leader? Yeah, so I think one of the one of the biggest mistakes we see is this um, this uh, you know kind of expecting too many changes to happen too quickly. Right, so we got to take into account inertia, right? You know, um, you know, we we all know from school that objects in, at rest tend to stay at rest, objects in motion tend to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force, right? So the same is true with an organization or a culture. Um, they have a set of habits, they have a set of work practices that they're doing, both formal and informal, and it, and it works for them. So when you start asking them to do something drastically different, you know, there's, there's some adjustment period where 
you know they they stop doing the old stuff, start doing the new stuff, right? So you can't you can't stop a train on a dime, right? So a lot of one of the big mistakes we see with leadership is they expect too much change too quickly without an excess outside force, right? There's nothing wrong with expecting a lot of change quickly if you have a very large outside force acting, right? So, so if, you, if you're not going to choose to have a large outside force like an organization helping you with the change or, you know, charismatic leaders you've brought in specifically to affect the change, if you're not going to, you know, use some significantly large outside force, then it's unreasonable to expect too much change too quickly. It, it literally is against the law, if you will, the law of inertia. Well, and hey, um, Andy, someone, and I, I don't think we have a presentation specific to change management, so someone brought up um, maybe just you sharing what you think a key, couple key factors are in the change management side of, of the leadership playbook, if you will. Sure, sure. You know, part of, part of the elements, you know what, we've got a couple of slides coming up that the presentations coming up that really speak to change. What say we hold that question till after we've done those other two slides, those other two presentations, and that will answer that will answer some, if not all, of that particular question. Is that okay? Sounds like a plan. Okay. All right. Cool. So the second keynote is uh, titled "General Motors Predictive Maintenance Transition Through Downsizing and Bankruptcy." Um, Obviously, General Motors, at one time, largest corporation in the world, uh, they they have been in the predictive maintenance uh, realm or world for quite some time, and their journey's been somewhat tumultuous. You know, it's uh, up, down, up, down, up, down kind of thing. So, uh, Dave Ryber is going to give a bit of a history of some of those ups and downs, and kind of where they are at the moment as they're growing the predictive sciences uh, again back at General Motors. So as I was reading through that, I got to thinking about, you know, dynamic change, right? So, you know, change by its definition is, is dynamic, right? So you get a lot of people thinking that, you know, oh, a lot of education, a lot of training, right? And education and training are necessary for sure, but not sufficient, right? Uh, we must have that real life positive experience to complete the picture. More about this later as we talk about some of the other presentations. But for now, just realize that, you know, when we think about changing someone's behavior psychologically, it cannot just be education. It has to be a combination of education and experience. And this is where the leadership comes in. You know, where leadership kind of takes them by the hand and says, come on, I'm going to guide you through a shared positive experience so that in your mind you've got the new knowledge and you've got the experience to reflect upon and that'll make it easier for you to kind of accept you know the, the, the new thing and, and this all plays to the old adage you know I'll believe it when I see it or that whole you know we listen with our eyes first right so a lot of people love these types of presentations these real life stories from companies like General Motors and stuff because they can relate to those real life stories even if they haven't experienced it themselves it becomes something of a vicarious experience for them right you know they've got the knowledge but they don't yet have the experience because they hadn't tried those things or been through those exact challenges but when they see other people in similar organizations and they hear their story, um, it's a bit of a vicarious experience. So it really helps it really helps us to kind of shift, you know, increase motivation and shift our behaviors because we're getting the knowledge and we're getting some variant of experience. It's not direct experience, but it's a vicarious experience as we listen to people like Dave tell their story. So these real life case histories, these real life stories are actually more powerful psychologically than most, most people realize. And um, they are, um, they're, they're, they, they can be, you know, uh, they can have quite an effect on people. So really encourage you to, you know, attend that one, pay attention to that one and that kind of thing. You probably pick up a lot of good nuggets because organization that large and if, if there were any kind of problems, they would have probably seen each one of them a couple of times as long as they've been doing 
PDM at General Motors. Hey, Andy, in um, in any size organization, you know, when they start to downsize, and it affects the entire organization. Obviously, you know, we're more concerned right now talking about how it affects, say, a maintenance department. You know, you can imagine what happens to the a PDM or a condition monitoring program when they have less people. Do you have any tips, tricks, anything you can share on how do you keep your PDM program on track when all of a sudden you're faced with a, a numbers change, when you have less people to do it? Well, uh, yeah, I, I think I understand the question. So, un unfortunately, it's a, it's a bit of a thing, you know, demonstrating value, right? So if the PDM group's the first one to get cut when the downsizing occurs, it's a pretty solid indicator that whoever was kind of leading that effort has not successfully or completely established the value. Because if they had completely established it, not to say that it, you know, it wouldn't partially established, but if it had completely established, the PDM effort would be one of the last to get cut. Because it truly is what the, what the military likes to call a force multiplier, right? Um, you know, one person with a, with a vibe box or an ultrasound gun or an infrared gun, you know, one person with that toolkit can have a substantially larger impact than one person with a set of images. So that's what we mean by force multiplier. Force, force multiplier. So it, it all comes down to, you know, making sure that you've established the value of the PDM program. Now, here's the challenge, and specifically talking about change management. Um, the challenge with establishing value is that the perception of value for different people is different. You know, some people, by virtue of their personality, their attitude, and their position with the company, are only interested in financial value. Other people, by virtue of their personality, attitude, and position in the company, might only be interested in political value. So there's political, social, personal, and financial. You can kind of think of it like a quadrant, if you will, right? And not everybody, uh, not each, not everybody resonates. You know, when you talk about financial, or political, or social, or personal. Or the personal is the same as saying emotional, right? So, you know, the way you get along with others and the way they your, your group gets along with another group and so on and so forth. These are the different it's, these are different ways to establish value. So, PDM is you know fun, it has some significant financial value, but it also has a lot of political value, emotional value, and even social value. So, as, as if you're charged with leading that PDM effort. And, you're, and you know in the back of your mind your primary goal is to establish value of PDM within, within the context of the rest of the organization uh, so that one, the organization gets value from PDM because that's why you're there, but two, you know, kind of as a secondary objective, you know, kind of protecting the effort, if you will. So just realize that as you go around to your different primary and secondary stakeholders, not everybody's concerned with just dollars. Not everybody gets excited when you say, hey, we found a bad bearing. So you have to be able to present that value or establish that value in one of those four quadrants, if you will. And remember, those are financial, political, social, emotional. Right? So you gotta, you got to figure out what resonates with that stakeholder and make sure they you know, got a clear picture of value to the PDM in their mind. Okay, so we're ready to move on, Maureen? Yep. All right, cool. I would love, I'm, I'm already scheduled to do something else this week. I would love to see this particular presentation here. It, it talks about Amazon quietly enters reliability-centered maintenance. Right? So reliability-centered maintenance, or RCM, it really means lots of different things to different people. You know, not everybody thinks of the J1011 and 1012 standard, you know, the Nolan Hebrew study and RCM analysis. Some people refer to, you know, the general reliability effort as RCM. And in a way, it is reliability-centered maintenance, but we would spell that with all lowercase, you know, RCM, right? But so what Amazon's talking about here is the 
the implementation of infrared thermography and airborne ultrasound and contact, I'm assuming it's contact ultrasound because it says contact monitoring, um, with all of the equipment in its fulfillment center in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Um, I've seen pictures of fulfillment centers for Amazon and things like that and huge, huge, or, you know, huge buildings and conveyors running everywhere, moving boxes and packages and so on and so forth. I mean, it's just begging, just begging for PDM. Um, I, I would love to see this presentation because, you know, all the time we're asked, uh, the, you know, allied reliability, we're asked, hey, you know, there's the, the five big PDM technologies, you know, which do you, you know, which should we implement first, second, third kind of thing. And, and I think generally people are fairly shocked at our answer because uh, I think most people look at an organization like Allied and say, well, you know, they're all about vibration, which is not, it's not true. Uh, the answer to that question has always been and will always be uh, infrared and ultrasound. You've got to start with those two. Um, we love starting with infrared and ultrasound for a host of reasons. Um, you know, one, infrared is the only way to prevent actual fires. I don't mean emergencies. I mean fires, right? <laughs> so, you know, looking at all your electrical switch gear with infrared is just immensely powerful. Um, you know, when the combination of infrared and ultrasound on both electrical and mechanical apparatus is, you know, it's easy to understand. Uh, relative to, say, vibration or motor circuit analysis or something like that. Uh, it's cheaper to acquire, certainly cheaper to acquire relative to vibration and motor circuit analysis. Uh, it's much easier to implement. Um, it's universally applicable, and by that I mean, you know, with infrared and ultrasound, you can look at rotating equipment, you can look at stationary equipment like uh, uh, steam traps and valves and that kind of thing. You can look at electrical equipment. Um, they're the only two technologies that you can look at all three different types of equipment and get a lot of really excellent information out of in terms of you know failure modes that are occurring and what's happening within the machine and so on and so forth. So that's what I mean by universal, universally applicable. But, but most of all, I think the thing that makes you know all those other things are great and extremely important, but I think probably the defining characteristic of both infrared and ultrasound is that as you're trying to show someone who maybe didn't go through the one week class to uh, learn how to get started with this stuff, it's easy for somebody to accept or believe the information. I mean, we've all, those of us who are in the business, you know, you, you take an infrared camera, take a picture of a hot spot, Maybe it's a bearing, maybe it's an electrical connection, may, whatever it may be. And you print that thing out and you show it to someone who's never seen an infrared picture in their life, perhaps, unless, uh, excuse me, uh, with the exception of perhaps, you know, Schwarzenegger's movie Predator, right? And uh, probably didn't even know they were looking at an infrared camera when they were watching the movie. But uh, you show them the picture and you say, hey, that white spot is hot and the black spot is cold. And the, the little person in the back of their mind says, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's yeah, you can believe that. That's that's real. You know, no 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 question about it." Right? Uh, the same goes with the, the headphones. You know, you you take the headphones and the ultrasound unit out to uh, a valve or a motor or whatever, and you know, you let them listen to a couple of good ones. You know, bearings or valves, whatever you're listening to, and then you let them listen to the bad one. And there's no explanation required. You can see the look in their eyes. Yeah. I, I totally believe that. I totally get that that one's bad and those other ones were good. You got it. We'll we'll get the work order on the backlog and we'll we'll get we'll get get this thing scheduled. Right. Um, very different from vibration analysis, where you know we show them the screen full of funny looking blue lines, and then we say, see that tiny little blue line there. That means the brass cage on the shaft end bearing of that 500 horse motor is going bad. And the little person in the back of their mind says, no. No, there's no way you can know that. There's no way, there's no way that, I don't even know what those little blue lines mean, but there's no way you can know that. So just sell that silliness someplace else. Right? So, I mean, infrared and ultrasound are always the place to start for, for all of these reasons here. 
So I think Amazon's story is going to be a great story, and it's going to be something that everybody can relate to if you haven't started the program. You certainly relate to it if you have started your PDM program, but if you have not started your PDM program, I think you're going to find it immensely powerful in terms of real-life scenario that you can identify with. So, um, all right. So I think, Maureen, we're, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say I think we're good, um, so we okay. can head on Do down to the next one. presentation. Okay. Yep. Great. So this next one, um, developing a sustainable reliability program. Well, that right there is kind of like, you know, the motherhood and apple pie kind of patriotism kind of thing, because that's what we all want. And that's what we're all wondering, how do we, how do we actually do that? And, you know, the, you know, when I look through this abstract, I'm seeing things like people, processes, and technology. You know, those are, you know, the three essential building blocks of any kind of technical change. And I'm looking down through here and I'm seeing maximize the benefits obtained from, and I'm also seeing things like the, the roadmap and the timeline. Well, th those last two things really hit on probably two of the most important pieces when we start talking about implementing reliability and getting somebody to approve the plan for implementing reliability. So if we think about, you know, benefits, um, it, it benefits are very important to us because we want to convey these benefits or what the likely benefits are going to be to those who are signing the check, right? Because, you know, and, and it's it's hard to, it's, it becomes an important topic because if we've never done it, you know, we see these other programs and we've seen their case histories and we've heard their stories. So we believe, but inside our walls, we have no proof, right? So we have to, you know, we have to, to get started, we have to use the benefits that others have produced. And uh, sometimes it makes me wonder, you know, why, why we have to do that when this stuff's been proven over and over and over and over again over the past 50 or 60 years. But that doesn't change the fact that, you know, somebody's going to ask for a business case. Somebody's going to ask for what are the benefits of this before I sign off on all this money you want or all this effort you want, right? So sitting through this presentation, I think for those of you who are thinking about implementing a program or even expanding a program, you know, seeing how, you know, seeing one way to, you know, uh, display those benefits and how they're related to your effort is going to be a really powerful thing. Uh, maps and timelines, you know, everybody loves maps and timelines, especially those who are trying to get other people to sign off on a journey, right? So the maps and timelines, it, one, it relieves uncertainty. You know, I can show you a map, and immediately you feel more confident that, uh, you know, A, I know what I'm talking about. B, you know what you're getting into. Uh, those maps and timelines offer us those kind of step-by-step -step instructions. You know, other people have done this successfully. All we have to do is follow this map or this timeline, and we're going to be successful, right? So if you want to think about it psychologically, it's safer, right? So I think that's why we love maps, we love timelines, we love models, because it relieves that uncertainty and it's actually easy for us to, you know, show show that there's not near as much risk as maybe you once thought there was. So, you know, imp presentations like this are quite powerful because it helps us to, uh, you know, kind of get our picture together, get our story together as we try to either implement a new program or at least expand an existing one. Hey Andy, this is probably a difficult one, but because I know there's so many different factors involved, but if you really had to put your finger on one thing, what would you say is the most important aspect of making a reliability program sustainable? One thing. You get to pick one. Yeah. We don't have time for two? <laughs> Maybe. Just one? Just one? Okay. Just one. All right. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's this idea that um, the the way you, maybe I'll start this way the way you know a change has been successful 
is when the people in the organization are choosing the new method over the old method of their own volition and under stress. Right, so let me let me explain that a little deeper. Right, so uh, you know when you've got a change champion, and they're kind of making their rounds and checking their traps, if you will, and kind of keeping their you know, their their thumb on the pulse of the organization and whether or not they're you know trying out the new behaviors, whatever they may be, and choosing the new behaviors. You know that's all well and good because I know that the champion's coming around. On his making his rounds, and you know, I need to be choosing the new behavior because he's watching. And if he catches me doing it the old way, then he's gonna, you know, he's gonna want to have the old pep talk with me, that kind of thing. But you know, the change champion is only necessary as long as we're in that transition period. Now, the transition period is is over when, without that person looking over my shoulder, I'm still choosing the new behavior because. I have finally, I've done it enough now that I have figured out it truly is a better way, right? And when I can do that, when I'm doing that under stress, then the organization truly knows the change champion can move on to something else because they're no longer, they're no longer needed, right? So, so that all sounds well and good kind of philosophically, right? But the, the, the trouble is, is how do we accomplish that, right? So the one thing that I would say, a, you know, we've all heard this phrase before, but the one thing, if I could put my one finger on the one thing that makes it sustainable, is that that gentle pressure relentlessly applied, right? So think of it this way. You know, any time we start a change initiative, whatever it may be, one of the big mistakes people make is they, they bite off too much too soon, right? And they, bought off, they bit off so much that they couldn't, they couldn't eat it. They couldn't digest it. And as a result... It, it, it fell flat on its face, right? So the one thing that makes a program sustainable is, hey, we, we need to be thinking about small goals and small victories at first to build confidence in ourselves to take on a little bit larger goals and look for those little bit larger victories. And after a while, we're, you know, we're setting pretty ostentatious goals and we're achieving them because we started small and we, we celebrated those small victories, and the, and the achievement celebration of those small victories built confidence. And it's with that confidence that we move on to slightly bigger goals and slightly bigger goals yet, and so on and so forth, to, to the fact where we're making giant leaps and strides and improvements, and it, it really don't feel like we've done a whole lot, you know. And so that... You know, I, I don't know if you that, – those are my thoughts when, when you pose that question. So I don't know if I gave you one thing or four things, but that's, that's kind of my thoughts. Right? So, all right, Maureen, I'm going to move on here. Um, reliable asset management, can it provide a strategic competitive advantage? So known true, true for a long time, there's no doubt you sat through his presentation, you're – you're going to be impressed. Uh, Drew's a super smart guy, knows a lot about reliability, knows a lot about um, you know, the finances associated with reliability. So what he's talking about here, you can see down at the bottom, he's going to talk about micro, macro, uh, e microeconomics, macroeconomics, and the strategic implementation of investing in upper quartile equipment asset management practices. So upper quartile equipment asset management practices is another way of saying best practice, right? But best practice has been thrown around so much it's, it's probably becoming a bit passe, right? So we, we start, those of us who make these kind of presentations are starting to look for other ways to say the same thing because just the use of the term best practice tends to scare people off. But think about it this way. If you want best practice results, they come from best practice behaviors. I think that's what Drew's going to be talking about. You can't, you can't uh, luck into excellence, right? Excellence has to be cultivated, right? So we got to first thing we got to realize in our mind that behaviors produce results. You know, it's not luck, it's not chance. It's the way we act dictates the results we get. You want different results, got to have different behaviors. You want best practice results, got to have best practice behaviors. 
right? And, and, and I think Drew's going to show you guys a lot of evidence to that, right? So, so after you've made peace with the idea that behaviors produce results, then you got to make peace with the idea that you cannot manage results. You can only manage behaviors, and through managing behaviors you're going to get different results and you can measure the results. So maybe a little, uh, little catchphrase is, hey, we manage behaviors and we measure results. Right? So, um, so I think what Drew's going to be talking about is, you know, best practice results, you're going to have to have best practice behaviors to go with them. Right? So Andy, I've got a question from the audience. Um, okay. Can you give a specific example um, about how you know improved equipment reliability can actually increase throughput. Do you have any in your experience from plants you've worked with? A absolutely, absolutely. So um, you know, a lot of plants, a lot of clientele. Um, some were super successful because you know the project went well, the leadership was good, change management was good, you know the environment was right, so on and so forth. Some not so successful, you know the business climate changed beneath them or leadership changed and, and they weren't on board with the, the goal or that kind of thing. So I'm not going to sit here and say that every client engagement is super successful because that's just not the case. But there are plenty of client engagements that were very, very successful. And I don't want to go through and say specific client names. Uh, it's not a cop out. It's just, uh, you know, certain clients just don't like you advertising their results, right? But uh, I, here's what I want you to do, though. For those of you who are interested in that kind of thing and whoever posed that question, um, uh, in Google, just type Paul Behringer, B A R R I N G E R, Paul Behringer and reliability. And you're going to come to a website with Paul Behringer and he's going to have tons and tons and tons of very short white papers in there on reliability analysis using daily production output. And there are dozens of examples in there of organizations who gave a concerted effort to improve reliability and as a result their asset optimization losses were drastically reduced, which is another way of saying they made more product, and they made more product directly as a result of having more reliable equipment. And a lot of the papers that Paul has there are, uh, he's gotten permission from clients to you know, use their name and tell their specific story. So there are plenty of stories out there. But to, in my particular background, you know, we've worked with uh, some companies that are very, very heavy in chemical process. And when we've been associated with them over a three or four year journey, some of them 15 year journey, um, drastic changes, drastic reductions in the amount of equipment downtime and as a result drastic improvements in, you know, production and throughput. Now, please don't misquote me. Just because you make your equipment more reliable does not automatically mean you're going to produce more product. There are plenty of other factors in the equation. The equipment can be sitting there mechanically, electrically, hydraulically ready and healthy. But if the organization has people problems or process problems, and I don't mean process as in the way you you know, make chemicals, the process and the way people work together, those problems can create a lot of issues with production, right? So uh, don't, please don't misquote me, right? They're fixing equipment reliability, improving equipment reliability can produce, you know, increase the capacity, production capacity of the plant, but all the other processes have to be working kind of in concert to actually get more product out the door. Okay, this next one I think you guys will find particularly interesting. Um, known Tom for a long time. Tom's a super guy. Uh, pretty good, actually, real good speaker. And, and you're going to love his presentation. 
He's talking about obtaining value from condition monitoring. I mean, that's very, very near and dear to our hearts here at Allied. So I uh, probably got more detailed information on this particular one than, than all the rest of them. But um, uh, all he's talking about is here is how powerful condition monitoring is. And I think uh, a lot of people who might be coming to this conference may know to some degree how powerful condition monitoring is, but might not know it completely. And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, a lot of times we hear clients talking about, yep, got a PM program, got a PDM program, and you know, they don't say it, but you can tell by their practices that the two have never spoken to each other. <laughs> and they've never integrated the, the, the integrated the two and struck the proper balance between PM and PDM. So to put a super fine point on it in preparation for today's presentation, here's what I did. Um, I went into our failure modes database and I pulled out the failure modes associated with a motor driven centrifugal pump, a very typical machine kind of found out in that, found out in industry. Now I looked at you know an alternating current motor, it's belt driven to a centrifugal pump, it has a base, it has a bucket over in the motor control center that holds the breaker and the starter, and you know it has an instrument loop or two and went through there and analyzed all of the different failure modes that were reasonable and likely. And we got 122 reasonable and likely failure modes in the database. So they're, you know, not that every motor-driven centrifugal pump fails for 122 different reasons, but there are 122 that are reasonable and might even be likely in any given scenario, right? So what I was more interested in is not the total number, but how many of those PDM could not help with, where PM had to be used because PDM or condition monitoring could not help. Now, I think you may be shocked at the number. Only 27 failure modes required PM. That meant 95 of those failure modes could and should be covered with PDM. And I'll do the math so you don't have to. 88% PDM, 22% PM. Most organizations we run into, they've got it exactly backwards. 88% of an effort for a given motor-driven centrifugal pump, and they think PM is the answer. And 22% of the effort is PDM. They got it exactly backwards. So while some people have an appreciation for what a given technology can do, until you talk about all five PDM technologies and until you do the ferry modes analysis and until you do the mapping and run the numbers, some people I think just don't appreciate how powerful PDM can be for them and how much better it can make their world. So those of you who are interested in such things, I think you're going to find Tom's presentation very exciting because I'm sure Tom's going to give you even more detail similar to this about, you know, how, how well condition monitoring works. Um, Maureen, do we, anybody done any questions in? I think we're good just looking at the time because you've got quite a few more to, to get through. So I think uh, we'll, okay. we'll keep on trucking through. Okay, sounds good. Um, Leadership Playbook, The Art of Making Your Vision a Reality. Well, for the people who are asking the change management question, uh, this, I think, is the last presentation in the slide deck about, um, about change management and leadership and all that other stuff, right? So this ought to be a pretty good, uh, though I've never met Greg, I, I know Marshall Institute, a uh, well-respected organization, and uh, this, the topic of this particular presentation is quite is quite timely, quite powerful, right? Uh, when it comes to leadership and change management, one of the very, very early things you got to talk about is this idea of vision, right? And vision is kind of like the leader's, you know, picture of the future, right? So when we think about vision, you know, it's the picture of the future, and inside the picture, either implicit or explicit, is some kind of integrated explanation of why that particular picture of the future is good thing, right? So 
this is how leaders use um, the, you know, that picture of the future to help clarify direction for the group. It motivates people to take action because remember, either explicitly or implicitly, somewhere in that picture of the future, there's that integrated explanation of why this is a good thing. And then third, you know, it helps coordinate group action. So when we think about leading change, when we think about leading people, vision is a very key element because of these three reasons right here. So when we think about vision then, you know, vision has elements uh, that it, first it has to be imaginable, right? It can, you know, you got to be able to, it has to convey that picture of what the future looks like. Uh, it has to be desirable. You know, it, it, you know, we talked about those four aspects of value earlier, you know, the financial, political, social, and emotional, right? It, that vision has to convey those ideas. Uh, it's got to be feasible, meaning, you know, it looks realistic. It looks attainable. It looks like something that the organization can do. It's got to be focused. Um, it's got to be kind of connected to that uh, strategic uh, outcome of the company, connected to how we do business. It's got to be flexible. It's got to be able to adapt as the business environment changes, you know, among us, within us, which, is, which always happens. And then, of course, it's got to be communicable, right? It's got to be easy for those people that you convey the vision to. It's got to be easy for them to convey it to others. Right, so there's no doubt that uh, Greg's pres I think it's Greg, yeah, Greg's presentation on vision will be, you know, very beneficial to those of you who are uh, either leaders or aspiring leaders within your organization. Hey, Andy, what do you, what do you think? Just quick, quick, quick. Top three traits of a great leader. Top three. Again, you're limiting with the numbers, man. Um, well, I, the, the number one just immediately pops to mind. Number one is a, the, a leader, somebody who produces results. Right, it's just plain and simple. You know, if you if you're not producing results, there is no way anyone will ever look to you as, yeah, he's a leader, because first and foremost, that's what leaders do. They produce results, right? So. You know, so you could say the next ones are either how they produce results or the next ones are, you know, kind of uh, on a peer level with producing results. But, you know, great leaders, and I think we've all met some in our lives, you know, some of us had the benefit of meeting, a few, you know, more than a few. But great, great leaders have this fundamental belief in the goodness of people and a fundamental belief in the ability of people, right? They don't second guess people. They don't look down on people. They don't you know, think people are not smart enough to achieve, you know, whatever it is they need to achieve. Um, great leaders have the ability to build, uh, um, what's the word, coalitions. Great leaders have the ability to build coalitions, right? They have the ability to draw a group of people kind of and get them excited about their vision and get them moving in the same direction, and that's where that vision really comes in. And then, um, you know, really, really great leaders provide opportunities for their people to experiment, to fail in a safe environment, and then eventually, you know, figure it out and allows, you know, their people, their own people to kind of flourish in that environment, right? In essence, they're not micromanagers. They let, they let their people do their jobs, right? So there's four. I don't know. You said three, but I gave you four. <laughs> Very generous. <laughs> Uh, a new approach to standard work, a picture is worth a thousand words. I think this is going to be a great one. Um, more and more, you know, in the reliability world, we hear people talking about uh, procedures and, and so on and so forth. Well, from the lean world, you know, the lean influence on uh, procedures, we get a lot of, you know, hey, what about pictures? What about single point lessons? What about, you know, where, where are all the pictures? We're starting to get that more and more. Hey, where's the pictures? Where's the pictures? Where's the pictures, right? Well, the pictures are, you know, kind of visual cues to how to do a procedure or what a good thing looks like or what a bad thing looks like. And, you know, sometimes you get pictures of what good looks like. And sometimes you get pictures of what bad looks like. And they're both very, very powerful because those pictures, you know, they help us remove doubt and variation from the either the inspection process or from whatever procedure we're following. So pictures are very powerful. Um, 
it pictures, you know, the reason we love pictures is it kind of relieves the burden of verbal expression and explanation, right? You know, when if I ask you to write 400 words describing something, most people would freak out. But if I ask you, to, if I gave you a camera and give you, go tell you to take a picture of what good looks like, you'd do it with joy and you'd be back in five minutes, right? Because I've relieved you of that burden of verbal expression and explanation, right? So everybody, that's one of the reasons everybody loves pictures. Right. Um, pictures also eliminate the possibility of the, oh, you told me, but I didn't understand. The, the picture really helps eliminate that. Um, here's the problem, though. Pictures are difficult to get right. Uh, and now, for those of you who've been to this, maybe you, you'll amen it, but if you've got people who are going to be inspectors, I highly, highly suggest sending them to a non-destructive testing, visual testing level one class. It's eight hour class, it's not long, but the neat thing about that is even if you're not specifically interested in stress and corrosion, which is what that class emphasizes, what's good about that class is it teaches us to take good pictures. It teaches us to, it teaches us how to document what we're seeing. So if you're a person who's building work procedures and you're putting pictures in your work procedures, you've got to know how to take the picture such that anybody can understand what you took a picture of. I think we've all had this instance in where somebody in the plant brings us a picture of something and it's super clear and it's easy to see what they're under, what they're doing. You know, the way they frame the picture and the lighting and so on and so forth, they took a great picture and it's easy to see what they're talking about. Other people bring a picture, and you don't even know if you're holding it right side up or upside down, and you really have no clue what you're looking at. Well, th that level one VT class, they call it, is particularly good class on helping people understand, hey, here's some really good ways to take pictures and really good ways, you know, you know, mistakes people make when they take pictures. So, you know, any, any presentation about the value of pictures in procedures, uh, whether they be work procedures or inspection procedures, is going to be good, good stuff, real good stuff. Uh, let's see. Now, this particular presentation is very well linked to the next one. Uh, the next one is the benefits of transitioning from a craft-based to a procedure-based maintenance in, uh, in, the, in regulated industry. Um, so what, I think what the speaker is talking about here is craft-based has this connotation that, uh, you know, we've got talented mechanics and electricians. They know their job. They'll figure it out. Procedures-based maintenance says, yes, we have talented mechanics and electricians. However, we have a detailed procedure that we want people to follow. And if they'll follow the procedure, things will be even better. And this is absolutely true. I remember years ago, I um, got to sit in on a presentation with Jeffrey Liker, uh, author of The Toyota Way. And as I come into the come into the presentation late, but as I got in there, he was talking about he was saying some stuff that I'll never ever forget. He was talking about how out of uh, one side of Toyota's mouth they talk about the value of standardized work, and they talk about how everybody all the way to the top has a book that defines exactly how they're supposed to do their job. They they call it they call it standard work, right? But on the other side of their mouth, they talk about how much they value innovation and creativity. And to the casual observer, these feel like contradictory ideas. This idea of standardization and innovation, right? They feel mutually exclusive. But what Dr. Liker went on to talk about is they're not mutually exclusive. They're, they're not just complementary, but they're additive, right? They build on one another. And I'll never forget the phrase he used. He says, Standard work is the springboard from which innovators leap. Let me say that again because that is, it's very it, it's a beautiful phrase, right? Standardization is the springboard from which innovators leap. And what he ta what he's talking about was when we've got standard work, we do not have to spend a lot of cognitive effort to remember how to do it, or to figure out how to do it, or to create a way to do it. We don't have to expend any mental 
effort to do any of that. When we're f following a detailed procedure, we have a whole bunch of brain power left over, not being consumed at that moment in a very low stress environment. And with that extra brain power, you will see a new and better way to get around the problem or get through the problem. Now, if all your brain power is consumed trying to figure out a way to get it done, and as a result, you've placed a lot of stress upon yourself, you know, in addition to the stress that the rest of the organization has placed upon you, there is no way, unless you just literally trip over it, there's no way you're going to find a better way, an innovative way to do it, because all you're, all you're concentrating on is how do I get this thing done and get these people off my back. And I thought his explanation was absolutely beautiful. Uh, in the Japanese world, for those of you who practice martial arts may recognize some of these terms. In the Japanese world, mushin means no mind, right? Uh, you'll, you'll see karate or martial arts practitioners will practice a particular move till they can do it literally, quote, without thinking. And that's what they mean, right? A lot of times we say muscle memory or we'll say without thinking. Well, in the martial arts world, the Japanese martial arts world, they use the phrase mushin, no mind. It means do it without thinking, right? Now, if I can achieve doing it without thinking, I have what's called zanshin. I have this leftover or remaining mind. So it's what Dr. Leikert was talking about. I've got all this, all this leftover brain capacity that I can see around the problem, see through the problem, find innovative ways. Now, in a martial situation, that leftover brain power allows me to, you know, to uh, scan the rest of the environment, look for other threats. Right. So, let's, we're linking it back to maintenance, though. You know, we want to. We don't want our people to have to practice jobs until they get so familiar with it they don't need a procedure because nobody can afford that. As, so we have no, no left, no other option remaining except to build a detailed procedure that they're able to follow. And if we can get them following that procedure, we've got they're very smart people. We've got all this leftover brain power that they can be innovative with, and that's when it becomes powerful. All right, Maureen, do, do we just keep going, or do we stop at two and ask for questions? Well, how many, is it just one more presentation left? Um, let's see. I think so. Yes. Yeah, I think one. that's the last one. So let's knock that out. And then, uh, you know, for those of you that have asked questions we haven't gotten to, we'll, uh, we'll get those to Andy um, if he's the right one to answer them, or, or we'll just uh, email and answer them ourselves since, you know, can, to be fair on time. Just, can we just stay on the line for those who want to hang around? Or do, is that not well, I think it's best if we'll we'll just because some of these are probably they're probably a little bit long-winded anyway, so probably better for you to to answer offline. Oh, so I think it'll I'm be good. The, I'm in I'm in the mood to be long-winded. <laughs> okay, so real quick, um, we don't we don't want to leave Sean out. Sean's a, used to work with Sean. Sean's a good friend of mine. Uh, Sean's one of the very best in the business on uh, reliability training. Well, about, about training in general, but specifically reliability training. So those of you who are into uh, training or want to get into training or think that training is a very, very important thing, then I really, really encourage you to visit this presentation and pay attention because Sean is particularly good at talking about those things that make uh, training important to you. Now, what he's going to be talking about is things, you know, kind of give you the five ups, five downs, five things you can take back with you to help you, you know, uh, convey you know any reliability topic, and also five areas where you, you know your organization might be missing the boat. So we think about training. I just want you to remember one thing, right? Shifting someone's knowledge requires immersion, right? Uh, five minutes here and there does not challenge pre-existing opinions, right? And that's what training is all about. Training is about shifting your mind, shifting the way you're thinking. You used to think this way. You went to training, and now you think a different way. And five minutes here and there and those single point lessons hanging up on the wall doesn't do it. It has to be, you has to, there has to be some immersion someplace, right? Shifting someone's paradigm, shifting the way they think about something requires repeated cycles of instruction, reflection, experimentation, and feedback, right? So instruction alone doesn't do it. 
one instruction alone doesn't do it, right? This is where the immersion comes in. You've got to teach them. You've got to give them a little bit of time to think about what they just learned. You've got to allow them to experiment. You've got to give them some feedback on what they learned. And you've got to keep going through that cycle until they have kind of broken the old thinking habits, broken the old thinking patterns, and they've got the new thinking pattern firmly installed in their brain. Right, and that. So, what you can see, hopefully, you can see, is that training sets us up for these new and positive experiences that are going to be kind of like final nail in the coffin to shifting our behaviors. Right. So, there's, there's, uh, you know, those of you who are kind of into that kind of thing or think your organization needs to be doing more training. Highly, highly encourage you to visit and sit in on Sean's presentation. I think you're going to. I know you're going to come out of there with some, a lot of good nuggets to help you with that. Okay. Where are hey, we Andy, just, um, just to throw something at you, sort of a, I think might be a good way to end. In your opinion, do you think a lot of companies out there are maybe swinging the pendulum too far from a training standpoint into using online training, electronic training, and, and they're, they're losing sight of sort of the person-to-person -person training experience? Do you see some of that um, happening out there? Um, yeah, I mean, to, to a degree, so what's happening is, and, and you, you hit the nail on the head, right? I mean, if you don't have that, that feedback option, right, that opportunity to challenge someone's thinking, to say, okay, you saw that, tell me what you think, okay, yeah, you're right for these reasons, or no, you're wrong for these reasons, and get that back and forth where that paradigm actually shifts, then, you know, you're losing that ability, right? So, so where the online stuff or the remote stuff or the computer-based stuff is good for is, you know, um, initial awareness. You know, that first lesson in that topic, those tools work awesome for that. It's also good for refreshers, right? They've had the immersion training. Maybe it's been a little while since they used it or touched it or thought about it. So we'll give them the online stuff that will be a little reminder. You know, it's excellent for that. It's also excellent for, you know, what, what they might call a blended learning solution, right? So we give them a paper to read. We give them a video to watch. We give them an electronic exercise to do. We give them a, a, a field experiment to go do. We give them a project to go do. And, you know, they get live feedback about the project itself. So, yeah, there's no doubt that, uh, you know, people are seeing these online remote training things and they're thinking that's the answer to all my prayers and it's, it's not. It's not at all. It, they're very powerful, very helpful tools, but it's not the silver bullet, you know, that's going to fix all your training issues and you won't have to hire instructors and won't have to have, you know, training programs because it's just, it's not complete, it's not a complete picture. And in fact, it's, uh, if that's all you did, it would, I think you would find it to be grossly inadequate. Right, because of that very thing that you mentioned, Doug, you do, you, there's not that opportunity to challenge their thinking in front of their peers. And there's a whole lot of psychological research on that that's actually where the learning takes place. And, and it, you, you'd be surprised. Most people learn when they see other people get challenged. They don't really learn when they get challenged. So that classroom environment, that, that ask questions and kind of politely fight about it kind of thing till everybody achieves a common understanding, that's when it's super powerful. All right, so you really need to reach a pretty good balance on that. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's, that's and yeah, yeah, that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> All right, well, great. Um, so good note to end on. Um, obviously, we hope uh, folks are able to come in person and, and be uh, at our conferences uh, coming up in June. Um, and Andy, thanks so much. Obviously, we gave you a pretty tall order um, to, to go through in an hour uh, all these presentations that we're going to be listening to over two full days um, when, the, when the conference actually takes place and without having actually seen these presentations. So uh, we thank you for, for taking the time today to, to walk us through this and hopefully for those of you that were able to attend, you got a pretty good taste of what's to come, and, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to uh, make the decision to make it down there. I'm going to just take the screen back here real quick and uh, just 
have a couple closing slides here. So obviously, you know, what we've been talking about today, we've got the Reliable Asset World Conference uh, coming up June 2nd through the 5th in Clearwater Beach, Florida, um, and obviously Ultrasound World taking place at the same time. We'll do a Ultrasound World uh, preview webinar, webinar similar to this. Um, we'll have that coming out, get invites out for that here in a couple weeks. Um, so for those of you that are interested in what's going to be taking place there, um, you'll have the opportunity to, to do this, uh, this uh, similar kind of webinar for that. Um, and of course, all everything that we've got going on, you know, uesystems.com is, is the place to go for that. And I will just leave our contact information up here. And anybody that wants to get in touch with Andy, um, I can get you that, get you his information. Um, and for those of you that had some additional questions for him, we'll get those over to him to, uh, to be in touch. So thanks, everybody, for participating today. And again, thanks to you, Andy. And uh, we'll hope to see, see some of you down in Florida.